Surikati in the IT services, and uh, this is one line that uh, contributes to my interest and my engagement. The other line is my scientific background. I first studied physics, and after that, I studied cultural anthropology, and after that, I made a PhD in uh, business economics. My talk today is not a text talk, not a technical talk. I never dare to hold such a presentation uh, on a Java conference, for example. But I've got the experience that the IT community is very open-minded, and uh, that's the reason why I submitted this talk about uh, the political implications of having found uh, programming open source. And uh, you worked for me, and that's the reason why I'm here. Thank you. I enjoyed the Anna Rebenkov's talk about diversity a lot. And as you see, this talk uh, kind of a completion in, area, in various aspects to Anna's uh, presentation. Some of you may have heard the presentation yesterday about uh, building complex web applications and having fun. And uh, also this talk is a kind of an add-on to that talk. Obviously, fun is an issue in the, in the Python community. Starting from oneself, from the experiences one has made, and the ideas one has developed is always a good, good idea. But then you have to pay attention not to generalize. You might, be, you might be very unique, and then your ideas are not shared by anybody, or you might be bloody normal, and then your ideas are shared by everybody, but also something in between. To find out the correct numbers, you have to make a research. That's what I've made. I've made the experience that I enjoy software developing most of the time and always again. Therefore, I wonder whether this experience also only for me or the contrary is true for other people too. That's why I started my PhD research on motivations of open source programmers. My hypothesis was that fun is an important driver and may explain a lot of this interesting phenomenon. So, what kind of fun are we talking about? I show you oops, a movie. <laughs> Some of you may have seen this movie before. So enjoy it, and then... <laughs> yeah, obviously, this is kind of fun. <laughs> but it's, if you look at this uh, movie twice or more times, uh, it's a superficial kind of fun. It's a rather malicious pleasure on the shoulders of this poor man in the movie. And thinking about this movie twice, I think even the programmer that produced the software that drove the man in the movie so crazy, if this programmer didn't have much fun doing his work. So, I rather have a different fun in mind when I talk about fun. It's a kind of fun that psychologist uh, Chikshen Mirai described as low. And uh, the flow is constituted by five by six points, according to the, his uh, research. The first is uh, concentration and focusing. That means a high degree of concentration on a limited field of attention. A person engaged in the activity that creates the flow experience will have the opportunity to focus and delve into it. Next, a loss of feeling of self-consciousness. This means that action and awareness are merged when you're in the flow state. 
text that I distort the change of time. That's what I experience so a lot of time when I'm developing. But it's the sub subjective experience of my result that you don't know how many hours passed while you've been in the flow state. Next, control and high level of absorption. You have a sense of full personal control over the situation and activity. The next point is also <coughs> very important, clear goals and immediate feedback. You know what you have to do and when you have achieved it. If you failed, you can adjust your behavior as needed and immediately, and you can add a new iteration for, for, for that you can succeed and not stop the action with a, a frustration experience. Next point, the last point is the flow of actions. This means that each step leads fluently to the next as if the events are led by an inner logic. For that such a flow state can happen, such a flow experience, you need two important prerequisites that govern the situation. The first is attention focusing. The attention has to be focused on a limited field of stimulus. There must be no danger of distraction. And the second, more important point, there must be a balance between ability level and challenge. The perceived requirements have to be in balance with the person's ability level, whereas both requirements and person's abilities have to be over average. The actors see in the subjective view. Both two high challenges that leads to anxiety, or two low challenges that leads to boredom, will kill the low experience and will lead to frustration instead. Based on that understanding of fun, I've designed my study. I developed an online questionnaire with, with, with which I've been able to measure <coughs> the software developers engaged in the open source projects depending upon their available time and depending upon how by the uh, programming. So we have two input variables. The idea of this approach is to look at the variance of the dependent variable, in my case, the, enga the engagement in open source projects, and to look how much this variance correlates with the input variables. And the statistical method to achieve this is called the regression analysis. I posted this questionnaire to the open source community in 2004, and I got a response rate of uh, 1,338 points. At the same time, I did an analogous questionnaire between six software companies in Switzerland, and uh, this yielded a response rate of 114 points. So much for the study design. Here's the mathematical formulation of my hypothesis I tried to test. The dependent variable engagement as function of a program's time and his available time. We need both of the independent variables because if you don't have available time, you can't do uh, an engagement in open source projects. So you need the, the time. And I've modeled uh, the equation with quadratic terms having a negative sign in the quadratic term to express the diminishing marginal effect of an additional unit. With this model, I've been able to explain between 27 and 32 percent of the variance. That means my explanation is relevant, fun is relevant to explain the open source programmers engagement, but it lets room for additional explanations of this phenomenon. And then an additional insight I got, if you look at the results table, there's no quadratic term of the fun uh, variable. And that means that means that fun doesn't clear off 
We don't have a, a, an additional unit of fun is linearly transformed into, a, in, into engagement. That's for the basic results of my study. I've been able to create more insights looking at different subsamples. In my sam sample I got, I could identify a significant difference between hackers and professionals. And when I say about hackers, I mean developers who do open source programming mostly during their spare time. Whereas programmers, professionals, uh, developers who do open source programming mostly during at work and they are paid for their work. Uh, the difference I identified is that hackers, hackers have more fun about programming. So, this is quite of interesting. You may say uh, this is uh, not surprising. Uh, hackers and open source developers have more fun as uh, commercial uh, programmers. But if you look at the activity, the activity software programming is the same. So, what's the difference? The difference is in the context. Something in the context makes uh, less the same activity less fun in, in the commercial context. And therefore, I looked at the uh, context and I was able to identify five traits where open source and commercial projects differ. When I talk about open source software here, I assume that the contributors have freely chosen to contribute to the, to the project and that they do their contribution in their spare time, the hackers view. That given such open source projects usually have a project vision, because that's the basis upon which the hackers, the open source contributor, chooses to engage in this project. And also such projects provide optimal challenge because the programmer, the hacker, contributes exactly what he's able to do and what he finds interesting. Because unless he's not a masochist, he will not do something he finds boring. At least, maybe, and so the democracy uh, programming other uh, programming languages, but uh, for sure not the type of programmers they know as artists. Such open source projects usually have no deadlines because you can't impose deadlines on projects with a contributor's work uh, for the project in their spare time. Such projects don't have formal authority. Instead, authority is based on professional qualification. The projects don't offer monetary incentives that could institute, constitute formal authority. When you pay a software programmer for open or closed source projects, the projects you're in might or might not have a mission. But that's the uh, reason I have a question mark in this. Um, the same holds for the optimal challenge they provide. You participate in the software project because you're paid to do so. The formal authority commands you to do so. My data allowed me to calculate correlations between the family and the promise experience for the first four criteria. I couldn't calculate the effects of monetary incentives on them. So, the correlation analysis I made yielded the following result. I calculated highly significant correlations between project mission, between optimal challenge deadlines on the one side and fun on the other side. The existence or absence of formal authority didn't affect the fun experience that is uh, numbers tell. Is there a positive called uh, correlation between deadlines and time? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's uh, what uh, uh, comes as a surprise for me. <laughs> <laughs> I expected an extra sign, yeah, as you did. <laughs> but uh, my results uh, say that the contrary is true. And that means the more deadlines 
guy in a commercial project with more fun programming. <laughs> <laughs> and that's very interesting because that means that deadlines are no fun here. Yeah. Were you worried looking at the open source projects? Success 
of the leftist parties was the introduction of the system of provisions for the old age, or old age pension schemes. I'm sorry, in what sense do Chinese authorities recommend this? I'm sorry, I don't understand uh, how Chancellor of Bismarck can be described as a Yeah, he invented it. Correct. Correct. You are historically. Thank you for this. The original idea behind such schemes was to provide an income for the old in the times when they are not more employable, when they too weak to work. And this basic idea is an idea of insurance, and this of course makes sense. But in the meantime, the insurance idea was abolished, and we have a pure pension scheme. You go into pension because you're old enough, not because you're not more able to work. Such a system makes perfect sense if you hate the work you do. But how is it when you love the work? What does it tell about a society if one of the most important fights of important players in the political arena is to set you free from work as soon as possible? Of course, such an understanding of the work has had its reasons. At the industrial times of the modern societies around one century ago, the work in the factories was between hard and horrible. Working in the factories meant being exploited for most of the time. The commitment of the labor unions and the leftist parties and of this month <laughs> for the workers was important and beneficial. But those times changed. If you look at the sectoral distribution of the gross national product, we see that the industrial sector only contributes a quarter. The most important sector, both if we look at the contribution of the gross national product and the number of persons working in is the service sector. This shift of importance concerning the sectors was accompanied by a shift of importance of education. Education became more and more important. The importance of both the service sector and education has gone up. In the industrial times, the manual workers was the prototypical person in society. In the modern societies, it's the knowledge worker that has taken its place. I have copied the Wikipedia definition of the term knowledge economy. According to this definition, knowledge economy is a concept that supports the creation of knowledge by the employees in a company. The aspect that the knowledge created by the employees has to be in line with the company's goals is very important, I think. Let's approach the fact that we live in a knowledge society and that we work in a knowledge economy by putting us into the view of an employer. What does this fact mean for an employer? Then assume a rational employer that means at the end of the day he wants to have a profit. In a correctly institutional economy, he does this by selling products or services to customers. Because he can't do this all alone, he needs employees. As soon as he has employees, he runs into a program economical scientists call the principal agent program. The owner, that is the principal, and his employees, the agents, have different goals. The company is successful only if it manages to bring the employee's goals in line with the company's goals. Basically, the employee can exert two different concepts to achieve this. Control or loyalty. This is true for all societies with division of labor, I think. During the high times of industrialization, when most of the employees worked in factories and at assembly lines, control was the obvious choice. At the assembly line, you're almost automatically in line with the company's goals. But where are the assembly lines in the knowledge economy? In the knowledge economy, the determining factor is not what the employee achieves compared to predefined goals and plans. In the knowledge economy, there are target plans whose fulfillment can be measured by quantitative means. Predefined work can be handled by machines, by robots. They're much better suited to do such work. 
because they're much more efficient to do such work. When it comes to human work, it's much better when we let humans work in a flexible, in an uncontrolled context, where the fulfillment of the task depends upon the employee's creativity and ingenuity. The employee's ability to act and react in unplanned and unfamiliar situations is a central success factor, especially if the company acts in highly competitive areas. These are the employees which contribute to the company's advance and make it distinguishable from the competitors. It was Peter Ducker who first introduced the term knowledge economy. The Wall Street Journal labeled him as the dean of the US business and management philosophers. If you look through the management literature he wrote, you won't find anything about how to control the employees. Instead, you find lots of strong insights about how to motivate the employees, how to leverage their potential. The quotes I've taken from him, the two quotes, prove that he was perfectly aware of the importance of challenge and fun to motivate the employees. The, quote, the first quote, to make high demands based on the person's strengths, that's uh, nothing up again to provide challenge. And the second quote is about fun and its effects on the climate within the company. Kafka didn't work for companies whose employees didn't enjoy the work. He didn't this because he simply couldn't get somewhere in such companies. There's another five quote I repeat is it's from another psychologist who is below into the management literature. It's from Chichen Miyagi, which invented the flow concept. He is who discovered he discovered the flow, flow, flow phenomenon <coughs> and of course he was, he was aware of the fun and happiness. He was aware that fun and happiness is not only a matter of scientific research, but of economic and social practice too. But unfortunately, these findings didn't make it really into the manager's head, I think. That's at least what the yearly Gallup studies uh, show us. Gallup, the Gallup Institute makes uh, since uh, 10 years uh, an engagement index and the last year's results about Germany yielded the following data. Only 13% of the employees have high emotional binding to the company. 21% of the employees have no bindings at all. They behave destructive at the workplace. They show no personal engagement, instead they do work to do. The absent time of such employees is 28% higher than those of their colleagues. They don't contribute any ideas to the company and 59% of them plan to leave the company within a year. Most, the most frequent substantiation of such behavior is, according to Gallup, the missing attention of, and recognition of the superiors. The employees don't find themselves sufficiently promoted and the, and the employee's opinion is not appreciated. And this is exactly the contrary of what Kafka and Chichen Mihai promoted. Fully motivated employees have significant costs. For Germany, the Gallup Institute, Institute uh, estimated the cost of 126 million Euro per year. Let's speak a uh, into the concept of loyalty. To fully understand the meaning of the term loyalty, it's worth to look at the alterna alternatives. In 1970, the economist Albert Hirschman came up with a very influential concept that he explained, that he explained using the three terms exit, voice, and loyalty. These three terms describe on the most generic level the basic interactions of an individual vis-a-vis -vis the organization or company. 
if the organization is a company, the individuals may be customers or employees. In the political area, the individuals are citizens or inhabitants. The terms describe different interaction channels that transmit information of possibly different kind and of different strengths. An organization that has to orient on the needs of the individuals, for example, on the needs of customers, will seek for the signals sent through these channels. The more dynamic an organization is, the better it is in deciphering these signals and the sooner it is able to adapt. Exit is the channel through which the weakest signals are sent. But at the same time, exit is a method causing the biggest costs. If a company loses customers, the company has to find new customers, and this is costly. In an undemocratic state, if uh, this state loses citizens, it has to pull up walls on the borders, and this causes heavy costs on various levels. The side of the obvious, the, the physical exit, is the exit in the inner emigration. Everybody with no emotional binding of the company will either leave the company or do work to rule, and will be absent whenever possible. An organization that is aware of the exit option will try to make the voice option as easy and attractive as possible. If an unsatisfied customer complains in, instead of exiting silently, it provides valuable information to the company. An attentive company will adapt as soon as possible and start preventing the silent costs of many other customers. And the same holds for a critical employee too. They provide very valuable information to the company, to the attentive company. The loyal individual is providing the most value for the organization. He is in, in line with the goals of the organization without control. The employee, the employee can't command loyalty and he can't buy loyalty only by giving the salary. Salary is important, salary is related to the contractual level. Workforce is exchanged on salary. You work and you get paid. But when it comes to loyalty, it's, it's more than contractual. It's a different level. It's an exchange tool. The employee gives his loyalty if the, if the employer gives him the possibility to evolve his potential in return. For that, the employer can evolve the employee's potential he has to be aware of his potential, he has to offer the challenges, and he has to offer a direction. And this is exactly the conditions that make that the employee enjoys the work he does. At least according to my study about the motivations of open source programmers. And at the same time, these are the means to bring the employee in line with the organizational goals. Of course, all these considerations make sense only for the individuals and organizations in a knowledge economy and a knowledge society. So I finished my reflections and I can recapitulate. Because of the division of labor and because of the knowledge economy, the employer has to bring the employees in line to organizational schools. The employer can either control or he can trust on the employee's loyalty. When you control, you get what you see, but that's probably not what you want. In particular, you don't get anything surprising or innovative. But in the knowledge economy, companies have to be innovative. Therefore, companies do better if they seek the employers for the employee's loyalty. The employees are willing to give their loyalty in exchange for the employee's willingness to evolve their potential. An employee can evolve the potential to the employee's presence if he's aware of the strengths of the employees, if he esteems the work the employee does, if he provides a vision of the company the employee works in, and if he provides challenging objectives the employees have to achieve. Under such conditions, the employee is both in line with the company's goals 
and he has found me to make the work he does. With his work, he creates valuable goods and thus provides to the employer's profit. Thus, I prove that one is by no means a privilege of open source programmers nor of software developers in general, but it's a common feature of work in the knowledge economy and knowledge society. Now, what are the political implications of that fact, of the fact that work can and should be fun for all? One is obvious. The leftist double time, let's get rid of work, has become kind of obsolete. What really matters now is to get freedom at work. We should ask for political organizations that, that commit to the quality of work. If we care for the quality of work at the same time, we have to insist on the value that is created through work. We have to insist, we have to appreciate that the value that is created through work. Consumption, that is okay, but creation is better. If it's gone, the value is created by work, we hardly can, can appreciate work as such. Some people claim that because of technology, technological advances, work will run out. So why bother about the quality of work if there's no work left over? But I don't agree with such ideas. We don't have to worry that work could run out. The service sector's potential to create work is unlimited, I think. Many companies still didn't get the lesson, and they provide poor work and poor workplaces for their employees. At least that's what the early Gallup studies show. So what can we do to achieve an economy that provides work for all that is fun to do? I am convinced that bad companies cannot survive in the long because, as Dr. pointed it out, bad companies produce mean quality. Therefore, stiff competition in the market is good because it drives the bad companies out of the market as soon as possible. So that can they, that such companies can be replaced by better ones, by companies that provide good working places. However, there's an important social prerequisite. We have to make all individuals fit for the knowledge economy. Education is the key factor to achieve this. I am convinced that having fun while working is not only good for the individual, and it's by no means an end in itself. In contrary, it's good for the society as a whole because if a society succeeds to make work enjoyable for all, such a society will be more dynamic and capable of solving the upcoming social problems. And there are plenty of them at any time. So I hope you agree with, my, with me and share this view and life. Thank you for attending. Just out of interest, um, did you ask about the, the operating system, the software? <laughs> uh, working on the Windows companies doing commercial development, and did they have also such much fun? Switzerland. What is the result of that analysis and how does that affect your company? 
out of your but in the edit for the inter the description. So gamification, right? Um, no. Turning it into games. Ah, uh -huh, yeah. Like okay. like interface. But uh, you said that it's not so fun and so enjoyable. I think game is very so. Um, <laughs> so, um, how many times they the check your email? So, if you're more like us. You could check email every five minutes, and then you check Slack and Reddit, and um, so <laughs> check the research on uh, the way brain works is that every time there's a new um, story of Slack you get like a small uh, chemical reaction, which is essentially the same as you know getting drugs. Um, so, um, but the trick is that if, even like in gambling. When you roll the dice, it's the happiness of getting the chance of being like of being uh, successful. Um, and if you turn that into a fun new game and everything is popular on Facebook today, or even you know World of Warcraft, uh, you can explore the same mechanics and get uh, like you know target defense games and everything. just things that you click for hours and you feel lousy but you still click. <laughs> um, and so there's like a, a whole body of knowledge that where basically you take a security guard and you have them, you know, you, you using computer graphics insert bad guys into their screens to keep them alert and to give them something to work. Um, so they essentially play World of Warcraft all day watching the monitors where otherwise they would be falling asleep. Um, and that way you get um, yeah, you get better performance, you can give them virtual gold, you can give them kills, they can pick to other uh, security guides. I'm not saying it's right, but it's something that industry is moving towards. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah, it doesn't give happiness, so it's not exactly fun. And I also have um, two comments. Uh, one is this. Uh, I sort of assume there's a fit between my um, interest and talent and market, which I think is not necessarily like it should. And the other comment would be that uh, I somehow doubt that move of um, manufacturing to China has to do something with China workers being happier at what they do. So um, just assuming that uh, competition with leads to a uh, happier workforce is kind of anxious. Yeah, that's a, a good point. But I think it's a, a stepwise approach. Uh, I think uh, it, in the, the uh, markets of the uh, developed countries, uh, they are outsourcing the uh, assembly lines to China and then to Vietnam and the poor countries. But, but at the same time, uh, they create wealth in these countries and it's the hope uh, that uh, if uh, there's more wealth, they can, uh, on the end, they have to provide uh, uh, work for these people to make content is uh, enjoyable. But uh, for the moment, uh, of course, that, uh, that's right, the poor work is outsourced to such countries. Uh, I will, uh, about the challenging part, to make it something challenging, it means intrinsically that I will eventually fail. It's, it's uh, not going to fail sometimes, not a real challenge for me. And uh, you can see it uh, on the scale in the sense that uh, you can fail in uh, making the software right the first time and then you can fix the bug. And this is very particular of the software environment. You cannot uh, fix after driving the bus. Uh, you try to turn better this time <laughs> and <laughs> challenging your last goal. <laughs> It's not exactly applicable in uh, this type of just the sense that making people fun, really challenging is applicable only when failure is okay. Yeah, 
that's uh, of course that's true. But I think uh, this uh, interpretation holds not only for the software industry but uh, for uh, various uh, other uh, aspects of the service sector. But of course, uh, uh, in a, the The health sector, yeah. <laughs> if the, uh, the medicine has to operate on a uh, human body, there is yes. <laughs> no such thing as a failure uh, possibility. <laughs> <laughs>
find yourself in situations where like an invisible patch of black eyes on the street hits you. Uh, playing it safe means crashing for certain. And so there is maybe acceptable. It's not something you want to advance. Ooh, let's put some patches of black eyes just to make things jump. So, <laughs> I want to thank you for making such a good case for companies adopting an agile mindset. Um, but I also want to point out that um, Chief Sant Mihaly in his research um, says that people are often totally unaware that they are in a state of flow. So he has a very special study design that accommodates for that. And he also finds that um, the state of flow is not something that is hard to reach in work and that there is that is not uh, flow is not dependent on education at all. Yeah. So, um, why do you come to these conclusions that education is key? My approach was that uh, the question was uh, why uh, to combine the flow state with uh, education and. My approach was that uh, education is important in the knowledge society and the knowledge society is the society most of us live in compared to the situation 100 years before. And the, the important thing is uh, uh, the principal age problem. Uh, the, Economy with division of labor is the employee, and on the other side, the employees. And the employee has to bring the employees in line with the with the company's goals. And 100 years ago, we could achieve this using the assembly line, using control. And in the knowledge economy, I think. I'm confident that this is not more true. Instead, he has to bring the employees in line through loyalty. And as a loyalty, uh, it, 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 it's an exchange. Uh, uh, the, employer, the employees are willing to give uh, loyalty if they get some kind of fun in the return. And can't hear you. Isn't it rather stuff like trust you give your uh, employees that gets them motivated rather than stuff for uh, stuff like education? Uh, uh, education comes in because of the of the knowledge economy. You only contribute, you are only in the knowledge economy because you are educated, you are with uh, uh, yeah, some kind of uh, more, more education to that for that you can contribute. And uh, these contributions are needed because knowledge, the players in the knowledge economy needs innovation. You need to be, you know, need to know the high level healing spells to get in the farm rates. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, so, so based on your conclusions, um, there could be a possible follow-up research where you take a look at the open source uh, projects and see how they structure the tasks. If there, uh, so what, how clearly they, they have goals and deadlines and release cycles and goals for those release cycles, how they structure single tasks so to give easier access and then compare that to the number of commits or contributions, messages, and images, uh, average time to answer the ticket, um, and, and run that across, I don't know, let's say, popular Python web frameworks, and see how, because you don't have nice five years of data, and you could get probably some good meta-analysis on top of that. Yeah. That would be, of course, would be very, very interesting, but uh, not working at a research institute instead of working at the uh, services department. I mean, software developer, I like this work. And unfortunately, 
I am not uh, at the moment in the position to do research, but uh, if uh, some uh, institutions or somebody here is in a position to do such uh, work, uh, I can uh, contribute to my experience and my data set. And uh, of course, I would love to see the such uh, uh, results of an additional follow up study. Early on in the presentation, you sort of uh, discussed the fact that uh, a traditional left-wing uh, platform was that uh, abolishing work, and you said we're making the case for making work more fun. But I think uh, I'm not a Marxist by any stretch, but uh, for capital, and one of the points that Marx makes is that one of his criticism of capitalism is that workers are alienated from work. And I think a lot of your analysis fits into that, which is, you know, in some sectors, I think you can make the case that workers have fun and can and have a stake in what they do, and I think the analysis is very important to that. But in uh, other uh, sectors, which are not in the knowledge economy, and which it's hard to imagine making them fun, I mean, a lot of the things that we use as uh, technology users, uh, iPads were made in a factory in China that had a suicide rate that was ridiculously high because workers were being made to work 24 hours a day. So I don't think the workers there are having fun. It's, they are working there because it's cheap and the Chinese government doesn't crack down on certain working practices. So how do you see that extending I mean, so that all work becomes fun and not just, you know, for us privileged programmers that get to do really interesting stuff? Yeah, that's a good point. I think maybe that's all there. Perspective, but uh, if you look at the historical data of the modern societies, we see in all modern societies that the, the, the third sector increased uh, its contribution to cross national product, but more and more uh, people are employed in the third sector. And I think uh, that there are uh, various uh, signs that uh, the same. Uh, steps are uh, uh, same perspective is uh, also for also also for for uh, for China for the uh, developing countries, but of course that's uh, that's the future. And, uh, but that's my, my hope that uh, those uh, economies will uh, evolve. Uh, uh, in an analogous way, as uh, we have seen in the, uh, the industrial, industrialized and the developed countries, and maybe this uh, uh, evolution will be far faster than uh, for us in the last centuries. And uh, this is, all, of course, the, the hope that uh, this uh, uh, evolution uh, will. will proceed uh, faster in, in, in the nowadays evolving countries. And, yeah, at the, the moment we have uh, a separation between uh, the, the wealthy countries, the wealthy wealth, welfare economies on the one side, and uh, uh, many uh, countries, uh, many economies uh, with uh, the classical industrial uh, Output, yeah. But the world is changing. Uh, yeah, it's time for food. I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, the talk time is over. We should thank my.